Welcome to the Escape into Board Games podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Matt. And this is our escape from the real world where we talk about board games. In this episode, we talk about great games for giving. So please join us for the Escape into Board Games podcast. gamers are constantly looking for ways to recruit new members to the hobby. And what better way than around the holidays to give the gift of gaming? But which games will go on to get played and which ones will end up at the thrift shop? Presentation, learning curve, age range and player count all play a factor. But if you really want to hook that player and convert them into a lifelong gamer, it's all about knowing your audience. So please join us as we discuss some great games for giving. Hey, Chris, have you ever given a game as a gift? Oh, yeah. Yeah, to you. (laughs) (laughs) We've given gifts to each other, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Constantly. I mean, with friends and family that know us, it's a constant stream of games, for sure. Yeah. I mean, oh, you're at this age now? Here you go. Here's your ghost blitz. (laughs) Exactly. Everybody gets one. We think you're old enough for this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we give board games as gifts to our nieces and nephews. Yeah. We give them to our friends yeah. for birthdays. Yeah, my nieces and nephews are getting games every Christmas. Yeah. And my friends will get just copies of stuff randomly that I've got kicking around. I go to the thrift shop a lot and I do a lot of bargain hunting and I'll find multiple copies of the same game. And so everybody will get their copy of Ratatat Cat or whatever. Yeah ghost blitz and yeah yeah you have an amazing thrift shop by you which we will not disclose (laughs) to anyone under penalty of death because it's a gem it just happens to be next to where i work so i get to go there a lot i don't think it's the quality of the thrift shop so much as it is the amount of times we get to go yeah it could be that it could be that for me though the thrift shop around me is not so great so i'm not getting any gifts there yeah well often shop throughout the year you know and board games go on sale occasionally it's like oh that would be a good gift for so and so at christmas and we'll pick them up in you know march april may or whatever boxing day and hold on to them for a year sometimes and then gift them yeah and then like you you know every now and then we get a second copy of something and i usually try and sell it to somebody who's interested in it just because it feeds my habit you know (laughs) (laughs) goes into the pot (laughs) exactly but i'm always good with giving stuff away too if people want it and oh yeah yeah there's something good about giving someone a game that you know that they appreciate or that they're going to love and appreciate yes they're going to play this and their family's going to get together and the kids are going to get together and they're going to talk and they're going to share memories that's the gift right yeah it's just a box with some cardboard and some plastic pieces inside is really nothing to look at yeah but the memories it's going to produce are going to last forever. Exactly. Here's a gift of time together. That's essentially what we're doing, right? This is time with your friends and family. When my friends started having kids, Mm -hmm. I would stock up. I would do what you said. I would mail away for the three or four games from that one company and then squirrel a bunch away and just give them one at a time. Yeah. There's a board game company in Ontario called Family Pastimes. And they make these fully cooperative board games. I've talked about them before in our Five Fun Games for Families episode. Right. The name of the company is called Family Pastimes. And the top three games out of them would be Princess, Max, and Secret Door. Hmm. In Princess, players are trying to rescue the princess. And they have a series of challenges to overcome the first being the moat well how do they get past the moat there's a boat that they can find or maybe they can take the horse if they jump across it Hmm. so there's a memory match thing going on where they have to 
remember where the horse is and remember where the boat is. But then there's also this storytelling element where they get to say, well, oh no, I used the gem to bribe the guard and I got the guard to leave because he just really enamored by the gem. Right. And you can make up any story you want, right? You can say, oh, well, the, the horse, I let the horse loose and then the guard had to go run. Awesome. So there's all these different challenges that you have to overcome. And naturally you would think you can cross the moat with the boat. But you can also use something else. If you've got a, an imagination, you can kind of stretch that a little bit. Right. So it's got a neat little mechanism going on there. That sounds awesome. Yeah, all the art's very folky. It looks as though somebody's grandma has made it, <laughs> right? But it is completely cooperative. And because of that, and because of the very simple mechanisms, you can play it with mm. two-year-olds and three-year-olds, right? If they're willing to sit down and just take some time, we're going to roll some dice, we're going to move around the board... Hmm. We can follow these simple directions. We can have a we can have a really good time with this game. Max the cat is the story of how you're trying to get the squirrel, the bird, and the chipmunk into the tree safely before the family cat runs and chases and catches them. Mm. So if the cat gets too close, you can lure the cat back with some kibble or whatever, some catnip, and he comes back. And the kids are rolling the dice, and when they get the choice, okay, I can move an animal, or I can, I have to move the cat. And this is just fully cooperative game. It's just delightful. Cute. And again, the art's very, very folky. It's not, you know, mind blowing, but it's simple mechanisms and the fact that it's it's cooperative and it's very simple. Yeah. And so we've had a huge hit with these games. Secret Door is the next step up. It's just basically a matching game. You have to find where the treasure is and stuff. It's just. It's just great. So the kid, the really little kids, the three-year-olds, they just love it. Cool. They absolutely love it. When we're all playing it together, and it's just as challenging for the adults as it is for the kids, right? It's not. It's not like the adults know the answer, right? They have to do the things too, right? We have to look under there and remember where that is. Yeah. And so it's not boring for anybody. It's, so that's it. Really, you know, it's what what makes a good game good for for the audience is if. It's suitable for that young, you know, young kid, but then everyone else at the table is having a good time too. Then it's a winner. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. This company sounds really fantastic. I, I'm not familiar with them at all. They make hundreds and hundreds of a huge catalog because they're local. They're Ontario company. So I do find them in the thrift shop and they've just made, you know, uh, caves and claws and ogres and, hmm. you know, trolls and just like all these different themes, but all of them. Fully cooperative, where the family just sits down and tries to solve the puzzle and fix the, you know, the thing. And yeah, yeah. it's really, really great. And and those three in particular work for just such a, such a young kids, right? Really, really young kids. You know, young kids that are willing to sit down, right? They can do snakes and ladders. Yeah. They can do this. Right. It's a hard age range to find games for. It's so true. Yeah. I mean, talking about sort of collecting games, my sister, yeah. she told me that she was pregnant with my niece. And I I think the next day I was at the <laughs> thrift store buying, <laughs> oh, we're going to buy this game. Or we're going to yeah. buy this game. That's a good starter yeah. to break, takes her to dexterity games. <laughs> so we'll be buying this one for four ninety nine at the thrift store. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. before she was out of the womb, I think she had the biggest unborn baby board game collection that there existed <laughs> all those haba boxes everything yellow yeah exactly right? all the haba things yeah that's a good earmark of a quality game right there's game right does some good stuff for the kids in haba yeah and dry machia spile has a couple of good ones one in particular for this age range would be the magician's kitchen hmm. which is one of those games where you take the lid off the box and the game is right there. It's inside the box, ready to go. Mm. And basically what it is, is a bunch of magnets rolling around under there in little pockets. You give the box a little shake, the magnets move to a new location, and then you have to push your magician's assistant across the kitchen carrying potion ingredients with your magic wand. And if they come across those magnets, the magician's assistant will will tip over. He'll he'll like lurch forward or she'll sort of lurch forward a little bit and spill the ingredient, which is a marble. Right. And so it's this right. little dexterity thing where you're kind of pushing the cute. Right. But it also memory, right? But like I can't go near that spot on the board because I remember there was a magnet there. So I'm gonna go scoot scooch over to this side. And you're just trying to get all your ingredients into the potion. And that's magician's kitchen. Yes, magician's kitchen. 
What's the name of the company again? I'm not familiar with them at all. Yes, we've talked about Dry Spiele before. They're a German company. Okay. <laughs> and they do cockroach poker and uh, magic labyrinth and spooky stairs. Hmm. Yeah. I've played cockroach poker with you, but I haven't <laughs> played those other ones. One of the games that I like for this age range, and it works really, really well for this age range up to basically up to seniors. Yes. I think personally. It's animal upon animal. You can't go wrong with a Haba game, first of all. You cannot, yeah. Haba makes wonderful games. They're yellow. You basically, you want to follow that age range on the box because they do have quite a range. And animal upon animal is one of them. And I think that it works. A friend of ours brought it to a con once. And I think there was four <laughs> adults just sitting around in this noisy room with a hundred people yes. playing animal upon animal. There was no kids around at our table. And we were just stacking it and, you know, oh, it fell oh no 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 i just yeah i think it works it works really really well i mean you can get those animals stacked pretty high and though it's hard yeah. because they're really funny shaped animals so yeah. it's kind of kind of plateaus at a certain point you just can't get it much higher it's not like jenga where you could just build yeah. a structurally sound structure for you know feet and feet and feet true this is very precarious and the pieces are big and fat and chunky and right like nicely painted and everything yeah it's like a whole bunch of different little animals and you're stacking them on top of each other these chunky wooden pieces yeah and the thing is too is like as your child grows the game gets more difficult because yeah. they've learned from watching adults or older kids play with them that oh if i stack this piece on its side that makes it really hard for the next guy or the next yeah, person yeah. or if i put it over here it's going to be precariously balanced and it may fall off yeah. but that's good and they learn to play more strategically yeah and it's the same game they played it when they were three four years old and it was just uh see if we can put it up and, and make your hands not shake too much before it falls <laughs> yeah. over. And then, you know, before you know it, they're 9, 10, 11 playing it with friends yeah. and they're strategically balancing these things to really mess with their opponents. And I think if you can keep your child involved in a game that long, that's a plus. My favorite game for this age range, and it might be at the high end of this age range, okay, is this completely cooperative deduction game. You know how I'm a huge fan of deduction games. <laughs> Big surprise. So you're saying you've got a deduction game that works for six-year-olds or, or younger. Yeah. On the box it says five, but because it's fully cooperative, you can go as low as three. Outfoxed. Outfoxed is a cooperative dice rolling deduction game for two to four players, ages five and up, that plays in about 20 minutes. Outfoxed was designed by Shannon Lyon, Marissa Pena, Colt Tipton Johnson, and published by GameRight in 2014. Mrs. Plumpert's prize pot pie has gone missing. <laughs> it's up to you and the other players to find out which fox is the culprit. Players move around the board collecting clues and questioning suspects, and with the help of the evidence scanner, they can eliminate suspects from the suspect pool. But they have to be quick. If you take too long to get clues and question the suspect, the thief will likely get away. I've not played this one, Outfoxed. I've seen the box, and I've seen a lot of people talk about it online, but I've not played it. Yeah, it's great. It is great. Yeah. yeah. So all the players are little chickens, oh. which is weird. And all the suspects are foxes. And they're represented by these little Sherlock Holmes hats on the board. They start in the middle of the board. Oh, okay. And it's a grid board and the players can go in any direction. But throughout the board are various locations where the clues are and the clues are face down. So you have to go to the clue square, figure out what it is, flip it over, and then apply that to the evidence scanner which is the real you know hook to this game okay and a mechanism i'd like to see in other games more often hmm. on your turn you roll some dice yahtzee style and you have to declare whether or not you're looking for suspects you want the eyeballs or if you're going to be searching for clues you want the footprints so you keep rolling and rolling until you get all of the same thing if after three rolls you don't have a match then the fox progresses the fox moves and he goes to escape. So that's a, that's a bad, you don't get to do anything. It's kind of a feel bad moment, 
but it doesn't happen too often. Okay. Hopefully you're pulling all eyeballs or all feet. And then if you get the eyeballs, you get to turn over the suspects. All the suspects start face down. Okay. But if you roll all feet, then that's how many f- steps you can move, how many grid movements you move. And then you get to the first clue, you pick it up, and it's a scarf. Mm. And you take the scarf token and you put it in the evidence scanner. You place it in the middle of the evidence scanner and you pull the evidence scanner open. It feels like you're operating a Polaroid, but it's just this little plastic screen, right? It's the size of a credit card, maybe a little bit bigger than a credit card, and has a little sliding panel. And when you do that, the notch in the token of the scarf will reveal either nothing or red. And if it's red, then that means the suspect also had a scarf. Hmm. Dun, 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 right? And then we're like, right. you know, okay, the, you stop the thing, right? Then you look around at all the suspects you've turned up so far. Hmm. If they have a scarf, then, okay, you know, you stay right there. You're not going anywhere until we've sorted this thing out. Yeah. But if they don't have a scarf, then you can put them back in the box. So you're doing this whole uncovering the suspects, flipping those cards over, and then getting more clues. And of course, not all the clues are right around the middle. You have to go all the way across the board to get those clues. And that's a lot of rolling, right? There's a lot of moving. Right. There's a few clues on the way as you're going to get them. Okay. But sometimes you need, you know, there's Harold. And then there's Gerald, and the only thing different is this guy's got a monocle, right? We have to find the monocle clue, and go figure out the difference between these two suspects. So it's a really clever little mechanism, and it's got that thing where the parents can help out a lot and give them lots of guidance if they're really little and they don't, you know, just figure out the basics. Right. Or they can just sit back and just, you know, I'm going to do my turn, you do your turn, let's figure out, you know, see if we can do this, right? Right. And I find that's the superior way to play the game because right. then the kid gets his own strategies and they get their own ideas about what they want to do. And there's a lot of sort of, no, 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 dad, let me show you how to do it. This is, it's, it's just step aside. I'm going to roll. I'm going to You know what I mean? And they're like... Because they can handle it and they're getting it done. It just gives them this big confidence boost. And, confidence right? boost. Right? Yeah, it's like, like they know it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not Candyland. Board game's not telling me what's happening to me. I'm telling it what I'm going to do, right? Right. I'm doing this. I'm going to look for that. I'm going to get to pick that up. I'm going to put it in the machine and open it up and I'm going to find out information, right? All the other games up to this point was, okay, what did the die say for me to do? Okay, I moved it forward. Now what happens? Okay, the board game's telling me I get this board. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. No, I'm going to boss this board game around. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to solve the mystery. I'm going to catch nice. the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just seen the kids just light up with this one. It's got the one page rule book. So if you, like we have just given it to mom and dad and gone, okay, good luck. Bye. And right. And they, and <laughs> nice, we come nice. back two weeks later and they're like, yeah, they really like it. And we're like, oh, phew, okay. Awesome. But we've also done the thing where we're like, here, you know, let me show you real quick how it works. And we play a game with them and they're like, oh, oh, I see the <laughs> potential here. That's cool. So how does the scanner mechanism work? Like, is it an electronic device with batteries? No, it's not at no, all. Okay. It's just really, really simple. I've seen it implemented in Black Sonata. It is a round token with a notch out of it. Okay. And the notch is in a different spot depending on what it is. Okay. So the scarf has a notch at like six o'clock right? and the monocle has a notch at seven o'clock and the cane has a notch at nine o'clock and the umbrella has a notch at three o'clock. So when you put the token in the scanner, it's not really a scanner, you just put it in the plastic frame and pull away the plastic from underneath it. All of those dots about what that suspect is, right? Harold has a scarf. He has a monocle. He has an umbrella. So there's red dots at three o'clock. There's red dots at nine o'clock, right? But we're only seeing the red dot pertaining to that piece of information, the scarf that we've placed in the scanner. And when we open it up, we can see through the notch in the scarf token to see the red dot on the card to say that Harold does in fact have a scarf. Mm. It's such a simple mechanism and we've seen it in other, like I've said, in other games, there is a solo deduction game, a hidden movement deduction game called Black Sonata that you're running around the city of London trying to find a character that's running away from you. Right. And it's completely a deck of cards that's been pre-programmed. You stacked it in a certain way. And then when you want to find out if you're correct or not, you take another card and place it over top of that card. And if you can, if you, the holes line up, then you've 
caught them right right yeah and it's just so it's like what this is like an analog computer that's crazy yeah how do they do that very interesting i've played black sonata and i remember being really impressed with that mechanism and how it worked i would like to see it in more board games for sure yeah like it is a really clever way to do that hidden information without another player implementing it or an app implementing it right and when the kids get older, I mean, even my youngest and I love this game and we continued to play it well after its age recommendation. Oh yeah. You can make it more difficult by every time you mess up the roll, the Fox just moves more spaces. It says, you know, he moves one or two spaces. Mm. When you first try the game, we were having a move four or five spaces every time. <laughs> wow. Right. And try to make it really, really hard. That's cool. Yeah. You can really ramp it up that way. It was a lot of fun. That's cool. It sounds like a good one. Outfoxed. That's for younger families, families with younger kids. Yeah, like newborns and up kind of thing, right? Like super, super young. Yeah. I think the next category of age, you know, sort of six, sure. seven, eight, nine, ten, they, yeah, yeah. there's a lot more games to choose from in that way. It really opens up. Yeah. We can assume that not all the kids are going to be reading at this point. Right. Right. And so we're not doing apples to apples. We're doing apples to apples, big picture. Yeah. Right. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But then the other dry Machia Spiele games come into this category, like the Enchanted Tower or the Magic Labyrinth. Okay. Which are two really terrific games for kids. The idea is that a witch has locked a princess up in the tower and she is a piece that clicks into this base up on the one side of the board and then she hides the key somewhere under one of the spaces on the board so several spaces on the board there's a small cardboard token and, and you lift that cardboard token up and underneath that it's a little hole in the board you could put the key cool right and everybody's trying to get to the key on time then which knows where the key is but the heroes do not the heroes are moving around the board roll and move style and when they move there's a magnet underneath the pawns and as they move you can hear the key kind of jump up and click against the pawn okay oh you go oh, you, you found it so you're just trying to get you're literally searching for a key around the board and then eventually you pick a pawn up and the key would be stuck to the bottom and you'd be like i found it <laughs> but meanwhile the witch is also roll and move trying to like beeline it directly to the key because she knows where it is right but the kids, the heroes are going to know, oh, the witch is moving in this direction. Okay, so maybe the key's over here, so I'm going to go this way. So maybe the witch is going to bluff and go in the wrong direction to begin with and then double back to pick up the key. <laughs> <laughs> and then whoever gets the key first will plunge the key into one of the locks around the outside of the tower that the princess is locked in. And if it's the correct hole, then she'll spring out of the top and be released. Hmm. But hopefully the heroes are doing this. But more often than not, you stick the key in, you wiggle it around and nothing happens. And then you take that key, you give it back to the witch. Everybody closes their eyes. The witch hides the key again. Everybody goes back to square one and then it begins again, another round. Mm. It's really quite delightful. And it's great for those kids. Yeah. Right? What are we dealing with here? We're just dealing with a little bit of roll and move. But now there's this challenge and this hunt and the right and yeah. i want to get there before you and where did they put it and it's almost like a bluffing thing i don't know and a tactile that experience of actually hearing the key clank against your character your pawn <laughs> yeah that sounds like a real a high point in the game right like yeah. you're always looking for that noise that click oh yeah. it's like you feel like you're yeah. cracking a safe right? you're like, yeah i imagine it gives that feeling of literally hunting yeah like feeling you're actually searching yeah the other one they make is the magic labyrinth. Okay. Where you construct a labyrinth out of wooden pieces that fit into this little grid. It's not like a labyrinth, but it, there's barriers. But then you hide that labyrinth underneath the board. Mm -hmm. And the pawns, again, have magnets underneath them. And there's a ball that sticks to that magnet. But the board is between the pawn and the magnet. And so you're running your player pawn across the board hoping to not run into a wall and when you run into a wall and cross that wall the ball can't go with it and it gets knocked off and then your character has to go back to the beginning reconnect the ball and start again and so it's highly reliant on memory hmm. 
which I find evens the playing field between parents and kids because kids have a great memory and parents do not. <laughs> yes. I refuse to play this game. I'm horrible. I'm horrible at it. <laughs> Because I'm constantly, wait a minute, the wall's here? Yeah, I'm okay. And then, of course, you just move your pawn one space. The wall was there. You're an idiot. Of course it was there. <laughs> the, the ball falls off, rolls about, and you're like, ugh. And it's got that clank, right? Like the ball hits the box. And the box is angled so that it'll always like roll to the edge so you can get it. Mm. And you just hear it hit the book, thunk, and you're like, oh. <laughs> and you're back to square one. Cool. You've played the Magic Labyrinth. I have not. I have not played it. Yeah, it sounds good. I have to obviously familiarize myself with this company, Dry... How do you say it again? Dry Mag? Uh, it's German, I believe, and I'm just going to butcher it for the fourth time this episode. <laughs> Dry Magia Spiele. There we go. The game that sort of sticks out in my mind is a couple dragon games. Oh, yeah. One is Dragomino, which is adults in the gaming world will be familiar with King Domino and Queen Domino. Oh, yeah. This is kind of like my first King Domino. No way. It's like a kid's version? Yeah, there's a kid's version. That's cool. I did not know that that existed. It's dragons and dragon eggs that you're looking for and, and matching them up. When you make a connection, you get a dragon egg, and then at the end, there's points. And it's just a delight. Like the kids are, are enjoy playing it. I like playing it. They light up. And the other one that is a dragon one, and it one really stood out. It's called Dragon's Breath, and I believe that's a Haba game. Okay. And that one is two to four players, and I think it's five and up. If you can picture these colorful circles, plastic circles, almost like a shower curtain ring. Okay. And they're stacked in the middle of the board, and you take the box lid off, and you're ready to play kind of thing. Nice. So there's like, I don't know, six or eight of these plastic circles stacked in the middle of the board, and then you pour in these plastic gems. Okay. So what happens is on your turn, everyone's going to guess what gem is going to fall out of this ring of gems, this dragon gems. Oh, okay. And so I'll say blue, you'll say red. And then I pull the topmost ring off and some of the gems or maybe a lot of the gems fall out. Okay. Now, some of the gems will fall into holes in the box. Okay. And they, if they fall into the holes on your side of the box, you'll get them as points. And some of them are going to fall into like the dragon's nest that's in the middle of the box. Mm. And those ones are lost to us. And then if you see any blue gems that came out because you guessed blue, yeah. you put them into your little cubby hole nice. and they count as points and, and the red ones would go for someone else. And then whoever has the most gems at the end of the game wins. Yeah. And I think there's, if I remember correctly, there's even a way that the dragon can win because he's had more oh, okay. gems than you. But I, I don't know. That might be a, a house rule. The game was taught to me by my five-year-old nephew. And <laughs> I loved it. He actually taught it to me and he was so proud oh, because I'm always right? the one teaching the game. And he's like, I've got it. I can teach this to I Uncle Chris. That. And yes. Yeah, it was so awesome. Yeah, when you get the, the five-year-old, the four or five, six-year-old, and you get them yeah. all excited about that new game, and they're just so excited to show you, oh, that's, yeah. this is exactly why we do this. <laughs> exactly. So I may be a little sketchy on some of the rules, but it didn't matter because I was just so proud and beaming. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was fun. We had a great time. I think we played it three or four times in a row. Like That's awesome. You know, it only takes 10, 15 minutes. And you know how I love dexterity games. You're pulling off yes. little pieces and things fall. That's awesome. On that note, the other dexterity game that I've had a lot of success with is one that we've talked about before on the Five Fun Games for Families episode. That was Click Clack Lumberjack. Oh, yeah. TikTok Woodman. It's, it's been published under a number of different titles. And that's this, you know, plastic tree and, and you kind of lightly tap. Tap, tap, tap. Yeah, with an axe and you're hoping only parts of the tree could fall off. Yeah. You get points. But if the core falls off, then you're going to lose points. That's a good one. Yeah. Speaking of dexterity games, in this age group, I would say Rhino Hero, the base mm. Rhino Hero, not Rhino Hero Super Battle, but just the regular Rhino Hero, right. makes for a great gift because of its small box, easy rules, and just, it's it's one of those games, it, we wouldn't call it like a gateway game so much as a lightning rod of a game. Yeah. So in Rhino Hero, you've got cards that are walls and cards that are roofs and floors. And you are building this tower 
based on the the directions of the the roof or the floor and then the next player puts another wall or two walls and then another roof and then walls and roof and walls and roof and before you know it you've got this tower that's you know six seven eight floors tall yeah in the middle of all this you've got this caped rhino <laughs> meeple character that's climbing up to the top and he's quite a heavy piece he's this wooden rhinoceros and he you know is making it harder because yeah the tower gets more and more unsteady and and starts to tip and of course if it falls over then you lose but yeah yeah that's a great game it really is that's a fun one yeah and like you said it's a lightning rod for attention like it is kids it is. will come from across the room what is that can i play it's really really quite good we would get it going at family camp at after lunch or whatever right it'd be like 200 people in this giant mess hall and then just three or four of us playing this rhino hero and it was just a just a huge crowd would gather around yeah hey what's what's that about what you guys doing there yeah because it's just like it's so eye-catching yeah a game that doesn't have quite the table presence but i love it is by a company called jolly thinkers okay they have a couple different versions one is called pick a pig oh, yeah. but they also have pick a dog pick a seal pick a polar bear there might be more that's right. yeah and this is like a, a speed slash matching game yeah so players are racing to match the one card that they've been dealt the top of their pile in front of them with all the other dogs that are laid out on these cards in the middle of the table. So their dog is a small dog that has brown fur and sunglasses. Yeah. And they have to find either the exact same matching dog and grab it before anyone else does and put it on top of their pile or the exact same match, but only one thing's different. So this dog <laughs> may have white fur instead of brown fur, yeah. but he's still got the sunglasses and all that kind of thing. <laughs> and you grab that one and you put it on top of your pile. And now <laughs> you've got a new dog that you're trying to match with the other ones. And you're constantly adding these cards to your, your table. And it's like you said, I think that if you play this one with adults, yeah. we tend to go a little slower with this kind of thing. And if you play it with, you know, this sort of yeah. six to 10, 11 year olds they just force the game to be much quicker yeah and yeah. they can really really clean up a lot yeah, in this it's, game. So true. <laughs> it's fun though that's yeah a good one. no that's a good one we love that one one more game that i want to mention is a game called caddy mini okay it was published here in canada by a company called mj games and this is an adorable game with a mechanism that i don't think i've really seen too many other places the idea is that every player has this cardboard room and it's got four walls on either side. And in the middle of the room are these different cat toys, like a ball of yarn or a soccer ball or mm -hmm. a doll or a wind up toy or a fish. Okay. And th these are, you know, objects that might attract a cat. They're in the middle of the room and along the walls are different pieces of furniture. So what's happening is the cat is chasing around this ball of twine that goes from one piece of furniture along the wall to another. Okay. And he's trying to catch or play with the toys that are scattered on the floor in the middle of the room. Okay. And so you do this by, you've got a little spool of thread of your color and along the side where the furniture is are these little notches. So you start, you know, at the blue chair and then you stretch the thread. You unwind it from the spool to the other wall that has the pink table. And as it, the thread goes across the room, mm -hmm. you're hoping it will cross across the, you know, the little fish toy that the cat wants to play with. Oh, okay. And you wrap it around that notch of the pink table. Okay. And then the next time it might go across the room to, you know, the mirror that's on the teal side and and you're trying to catch these little objects and, and you collect these tokens and at the end you get points for them. It's just it's such a delight. That's so crazy. Yeah. It's such a, a unique game in that you're using the thread to draw lines across the floor. And as the thread touches the pieces, you get points for them. You get the tokens that represent points for them. And whoever collects the most points wins. Very, very fun. 
Very, very cute. That's awesome. I think it's good for adults, but probably a little simple for adults. And it's aged five and up. So good. Nice. Five, six, seven, eight year old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very fun. That sounds cool. Very fun. Very cute. I think it could be done in a way that might be interesting for adults. And I, I hope someone does that because that's a mechanism that I think I'd like to see more of. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. A thread. Like, come on. We don't. How many games have yarn? Yeah. String Railway. That's the only other one that I. Yeah. That really stands out as. Yeah. Cool though. Interesting. Caddy Mini. Yep. When all the nieces and nephews turned five, they all got this next game for Christmas one year. Oh yeah, that's cool. And of course it was, it was more successful with some kids than it was with others, for sure. Okay. It was a lesson learned. This game isn't for everybody, but I think it's, it's the best game an adult can play with a kid this age. Hmm. Catan Jr. Catan Jr. is a dice rolling, network building, economic pirate game for two to four players ages six and up that takes about 30 minutes. Catan Jr. was designed by Klaus Tuber and published by Mayfair Games in 2011. You know, just reading that, it shocks me. It's 2011. Yeah. That's not that long ago. No. I feel like this game is much older than it is. It's been around a while, and it's been played a lot by a lot of people, just like its predecessor, Catan. Ahoy, matey! We are pirates, building hideouts and shipping lanes in the islands of Catan. But beware of Skull Island, for that is where the ghost captain lives. <laughs> <laughs> Catan Jr. is a simple Euro game where players focus on turning this into that. The this being wood, goats, molasses, swords, and gold, and the that being ships, hideouts, and parrot cards. So the first thing players familiar with Catan are going to notice about this version is instead of the resource cards, there's going to be resource tokens. So there's going to be little piles of these swords and barrels and goats everywhere. It's a really simplified version of this classic Euro game yeah. where we're turning our, you know, wood and sheep into roads. But this time we're doing these boats and little hideouts. So all these players get in their player color, I believe 10 of these little statues that look like little skull Island pirate yeah. hangout things. So they're really cool. Like, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like they're way more than what they needed to be. And the original game, it's like a little piece of wood. <laughs> and in this game, it's this beautifully sculpted, island fortress with a skull face on the front of it the components are amazing yeah. and like even the swords are like these you know thick cardboard and yeah they just feel great it's and everything looks good yeah it's a big chunky tokens yeah i had to make a foam core insert to keep it all organized because the game actually just comes with a big bowl that you're supposed to keep everything in and i just like no thanks that was maddening <laughs> so i made a little <laughs> bank to keep everything separate so you just reach in you can grab nice all the cutlasses or whatever when you need to nice yeah so just like Catan, players roll a die, just one this time, and each island pays out if their number gets rolled. This is how players acquire resources. Your forest island will always give you wood when a three is rolled, regardless of who rolls the three. If you roll a six, you get to move the ghost captain. Yeah. The captain works just like the robber in regular Catan, blocking resource production on the island that he's on. This is kind of like a big kid part of the game, right? Yeah. Turning this into that is a really important skill. I think that every kid needs to learn. Yeah. But I also feel that they need to feel that sting. The the bad feelings that come in a game. Yeah. They have to learn yeah. to be good winners and good losers. Yeah. And yeah. Catan Jr. is a good one for that. In this game, there's no trading and bartering. Right. Instead, there's a common bank that you can do a single one-to-one -one trade each turn. So that's interesting because then the game starts, uh, there's one of everything in the bank. Mm. And so you can just go, oh, I can swap this wood out for the gold. Right. Well, now there's no gold in the bank. So now it's really important who's making that trade first and what are they getting? And those choices are kind of interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of different paths to get to where you need to go in this game, right? You're going to need to, you know, get those resources, but there's a lot of different ways to do it, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Which makes it for like an interesting puzzle that the adult gets to do while the kid is sitting at the table, just learning the basics of a board game. Right. And learning, 
the mechanics and you know the strategy behind it but you you are actually playing the game yeah. with them and it's yeah. fun for everyone involved so this version of Catan is all about building that engine and turning those resources into boats and hideouts one of the other hallmarks of a euro game is there isn't so much of that i have to take what you have built away from you right Monopoly is the perfect example where for me to win the game, you have to be bankrupt. All your money has to be my money. <laughs> right. Right. But in a Euro game, particularly Catan is a good example. We're all trying to build up to seven victory points or 10 victory, whatever the case may be. Yeah. I don't need to take your victory points away. There's enough finite number of victory points to be had. Mm. It's just the first person to that number. And I find that that is a good game to play with kids this age. Right. Because even though there is a clear winner and we're each trying to do the thing better than the other person, I don't need to take your stuff away in order to win. Yeah. Like in Monopoly or Risk. Those are bad feelings. We've done the math. We figured it out. Mm. The game designers have wisened up. That kind of experience early can turn a young person off of board games in general. And that's why so many people our age look at games like Monopoly and Risk and they're like, eh, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't want to play, play board, board games. games. I don't like board games. Yeah, yeah. those are dumb. Mm -hmm. When you do play Catan Jr. with your kid and you totally smoke them and you've got your seven points and they have four, mm -hmm. they've looked at what you've done and then they, they go again and and then you get seven points and they get five. Yeah. And they're like, well, I still lost, but I didn't get four points. I only got five points. I'm doing better than I did last time. Oh, I'll just keep going with four more games. I'm going to beat them. Yeah, exactly. Right? And that right there gives the kid the hope. That yeah. There's a clear improvement happening. And we're going to keep going until, yeah. There's a lot that can be learned in a game of Catan Jr. We're going to get back to the show after a brief message. This next ad is for Chris's own company, Geeky Goodies. If you'd like to hear what an ad for your game, product, or website might sound like, drop us a line at escapeintoboardgames at gmail.com. When we escape into board games, we're always wearing our Geeky Goodies t-shirts. They are great conversation starters for gamers and non-gamers. But did you know that they also sell masks, socks, hoodies, game room posters, mugs, and so much more? All things board games. All things geeky. Visit geekygoodies.com and use coupon code ESCAPE for a 10% discount off your purchase. When you've got kids that can read, then the potential for games is completely different. Yeah. Like if you got a young family with kids, like still young kids, I don't know. Yeah, they're probably, what, 10, 11, 12, 13 yeah. even is kind of what we're thinking. Yeah. The game that comes to mind, I think, for that age group that works really well is Word on the Street. Yeah. We've talked about this before. On the several superior spelling games that supersede Scrabble episode. That's right. That's right. We talked about it there. And this one is a good one for families with kids that are, you know, learning to spell or, you know, even if they're good at spelling, I think that the game lends itself really well to different levels of encouraging reading and spelling. Yeah. You're basically making words with all the consonants and pulling them towards your side of the board, kind of like a tug of war kind of thing, right? Yeah. yeah a tug of war kind of game. And the more letters in the word that you come up with as a group, that appear on the board, the better, because those letters are going to get pulled to your side. And then the other team gets a try, and they're trying to pull some of those letters back until they're off the board and, and they win. Yeah. So that one works really well. And it's like you said, it's not so much spelling, although there, it is in there. It's more of a vocabulary game because you're trying to come up with bigger words with more letters, right? It's all about yeah. coming up with the words, not so much spelling them. Yeah, and and sometimes there's like, you know, Okay, we need a word that has a P in it, like the letter P. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? So you really have to think a little bit more about what word. The category is lake. Right. Right? Some goes body of water. I'm like, okay, now I have to come up with a lake with a, with a P in it. Oh, I yeah. could do the Pacific Ocean. Uh, yeah. No, Penguin that's a, or something. Yeah. It's a fun one. It's a fun one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. 
Junk Art, I think, is a fantastic dexterity game. Yeah, it's just a big, giant box of wooden blocks and pieces. Yeah. Different colors, of four or five different colors in there. And they're all different shapes, and there's some cards yeah. and group of different rules. Sometimes, I think it's like 10 or 12 different rules. And you'll flip the card, and you know now we're playing this game where everyone has to stack the tallest using only certain pieces. Yeah. Sometimes you're passing the piece to the player on your left, so you want to choose you know the really hard ones for them. Sometimes you're, you're almost drafting pieces because you want to make sure that the hard ones move along to the players on your left or right, and the good ones stay with yeah, you. Yeah. There's a bunch of different mini games. Yeah. All revolving around stacking these pieces. And you could play the same game three or four times in a night with no problem and have tons of fun. Yeah. Or you can play this like little tour of, you know, four or five or 10 or 12 of them. Yeah. yeah Some yeah. of them are communal. Where we're building one single structure in the middle. Yeah. So everyone's building in the middle and whoever knocks it down, you know, uh, that's yeah. a great dexterity game. Comes with a measuring tape so you can... You can figure out whose structure is the tallest at the end of the round. That's right. Yeah, that's a good one. For the kids that like video games, the one that I always gravitate towards is Slide Quest. And what kid doesn't like video games these days, right? I mean, yeah. Slide Quest is sort of a tabletop <laughs> version of a video game. Yeah. That's how I always felt about it. I always felt that the video game crowd would get really frustrated with the Slide Quest, though. That's true. Because it's a real world video game. How would you describe it? It's, it, it's one of those games, again, you take the lid off the box and it's sort of the box is the game. The box is there. Yeah. You put four paddles under each edge of the box to hold this platform yep. inside that has various holes in it and then you place your level sheet over top which has art and positions for the structures that you would build to set that level up and then you take your little dude which is a meeple with a ball bearing underneath him yeah and you place him at one end and with the paddles raise and lower that platform that's resting inside the box. So he rolls around the box on the inside <laughs> and you have to hit and collect different things and knock stuff over. And have him not fall in one of the holes. Which are everywhere. Yeah. And you generally want it to follow this sort of path that's, you know, loosely laid out yeah. on the cardboard overlay. Because you need to go through the certain checkpoints. Otherwise you have to start again. You have to clear the level. Yeah. And there's guards that you're blocking you and you have to knock them into one of the holes yes. and there's dynamite that if it falls over it explodes <laughs> but the key is each one of us has one side of the box yeah and you've got this little level and as you press down your side of the box goes up yeah and the opposite side goes down so your little marble guy starts sliding away from you <laughs> and then the person on your left does the same now the marble guy goes a bit to the right yeah the person on the opposite end now takes control and they start to lean them back towards you. And yeah. that's how you move this marble guy around the board. And there is a surprising amount of movement on that edge. Yes. Like you can go from really, really low to really, really high, really quickly. You're just like, you know, I'm just going to push this lever down. Yeah. The player on the other side of the table from you opposite, you could also push down on their lever and both sides could go up. At the same time. Right. So the whole board kind of rises up in the middle. Yeah. You're kind of fighting over it a little bit. Yeah. You really need a lot of cooperation and some teamwork. And if you got one of those heavy, ham-fisted teenagers, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it can be very frustrating. It's not going to work. It won't be fun, maybe. <laughs> I definitely think it's a game that's not for everybody. Yeah. I think it doesn't matter the age, whether they've played video games or not. It depends on the person. Yeah. You'll either find this amazing, amusing, and challenging, or you will find it incredibly difficult and frustrating. I'm of the amusing and creative and fun. I've experienced both, actually. Yeah. The first time I played it was with you, and there was a few of us, and it was. It was just like, let's, yeah, that was great. 
I wanted to find a level we couldn't beat and then just try to beat it. And then we played it a bunch and then eventually, you know, other people got tired and we put it away. I'm like, oh, okay, well, yeah. I'm going to have to buy this game. And of course I found a copy on sale and I brought it home and I presented it to the kids. And, and that was when it was kind of fell apart. And like, Oh really? Not everybody was as interested in keeping the little guy on the table as I was. And just, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> the flyer. it wasn't my kids. It was like, we had a small group yeah. and it's so easily broken by, if one participant isn't 100% into playing. Yeah, if you get bored of it and you're not paying attention or either of those is true, it can it can fall apart quite yeah, quickly. Yeah, And apparently you can play it solo. Like you can literally play all four sides, but... Uh, I can't see how that would be possible because you would need... It would be so hard. It would be so hard. You can only touch two at a time. Yeah. It's such a fun game. I don't play it nearly as much as I want to. I like that one. Nice. Good for families. Another good one in this section would be Sagrada, mm. which we spoke about in our beautiful board games episode. Yeah. Sagrada is this dice rolling dice placement game where you are designing and building a stained glass window using these beautiful translucent colorful dice that fit on your player board, this recessed player board. It was going to go on this list as a good example of a game great for this group. But I actually had a very good friend of mine buy this for his family last year for the holidays mm. and reported back to me and said that it was a huge hit. And it's the, it's a family favorite at this point now. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good one. It's beautiful. It's fun. It's really, really thinky. You can match your playing style to it however you play. That's right. You can just sort of go with the flow. I'm going to put this dice here. Oh, well, I can't put any dice this turn. Or you can be really, really strategic and try and take away dice from other players. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really quite clever. Tons of replayability, all the different tools. I really like that one. Yeah, that's great. Very, very good one. I would put this game to Mashikoro. Yeah. That one is city building and tableau building, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it takes the idea of, you know, downtime. So like when you're playing Scrabble and, you know, we're, we're all waiting for Tom to finish his <laughs> turn and think of that wonderful seven letter word that he's been working on. It's going to land on that triple word score just right. And we have nothing to do while we're waiting. Well, in Mashikoro, what happens is we are buying cards and putting them face up in front of us. And every turn you roll the dice and whatever number you roll, you consult the cards that are in front of you. And, you know, if I rolled an eight, then everyone who has an eight card in front of them gets the little bonus yeah. of either money or resources or an action or something yeah. that is listed on that card. Pays out every time, every turn yeah. pays out. Yeah, exactly. It has this tremendous comboing Yeah, where you can get a card that'll give you a point for every other card you have. Well, that's great if you have a bunch of those other cards. You just you double up on both of those cards, and then it's like an exponential growth. Really good feeling when that pays out. Yeah, very true. You're familiar with the game designer Prospero Hall. It's like a design company. Yeah, yeah, it's a company with a group of designers. I became aware of them when they made the board game Jaws, which was a mm. like a really simple, hidden movement, cat and mouse, everyone against the shark kind of game based on the famous movie. Yeah. And it was one of these new, like I'm really surprised with these yeah. licensed IP games now that are actually fun to play. Yeah. Because as we know, when we were growing up, this wasn't the case. No. If there was Spider-Man on the box, it was going to be a piece of crap. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If, if it had a comic book that you loved or a TV show that you were excited about, the game was going to be really boring. Prepare to have your heart broken. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not really the case now. There's a big list of yeah. them. There's The Shining, The Thing, there's Top Gun. Yeah. Yeah. And the list goes on and on and on. I mean, it does. Cartoons, Scooby Doo, Rick and Morty. Yeah. On and on and on. And I haven't played nearly enough of them. <laughs> Me too. As I'm aware, the Top Gun one involves playing beach ball volleyball at one point. And I'm right. So it's like, I'm not sure if the games take themselves too seriously. But when I played the Jaws game, I was thoroughly impressed yeah. that it was a, like we were learning it and playing it at the same time. It was everybody's first play. And we all just kind of, you know, really kind of got into it. The pieces, the components all evoked that Jaws feel without using images from the movie. Yeah. 
But at the same time, you know, there's the badge, and there's the lighthouse, and there's the boat, and all these things are very familiar images. Yeah, and the characters' names are the same. And- yeah, because it's actually based on the book, yeah. right? Which is which is fine. Yeah. Yeah, and then we've got those mechanisms, that cat and mouse, that hunting mechanisms where it feels like Jaws. Yeah. And I would have no qualms recommending that for a family that was into Jaws. Right. If they were yeah. like, oh, my Jaws is the best thing ever. I'm like, well, you can confidently buy that game, play it. You're going to have a great time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, you know, I haven't played as many of them as I want to, but I, yeah. After my experience with Jaws, and I think we played it together, yeah. didn't we? For yeah. the first time. Yeah. After my experience with Jaws, I, I really want to try these other ones, these Prospero Hall games. Yeah. Because they did such a great job. I'm, I'm kind of sold on them. Now, the thing is, you know, I'm not a fan of Top Gun or Rick and Morty. Sure. So I'm probably not going to rush out and play those. But if I go to someone's house who is a fan and they want to play this game, I'm all in. Yeah. It's Prospero Hall. But who better to play it with, though, too, right? You get to hear them yeah. act all, it all out and quote it and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Sign me up. And the Jaws one, it's like a movie. I mean, it's literally you play Act One. Yeah. And act one is everyone riding around in boats and running around the island trying to find out where Jaws is with the sensors and, and attach these fishing barrels to them. Oh, the, the barrels to the, yeah, the fishing barrels to Jaws. Yeah. yeah. And then act one ends and you flip over the board and you do act two where Jaws attacks the boat and the people <laughs> in the boat. That's a, that's a great one. Yeah. Another game is Just One. Just One is... I think it's a game that should be in everyone's collection. Oh, yeah. I think like code names, it's one that everyone should have just one. Yeah. If you're going to have just one, you should have just one. <laughs> uh, it, it plays a lot. Like it plays three to seven players. It yeah. plays in like 15, 20 minutes. Easy. Super easy to teach. And as long as the youngest person at the table can read. Yeah. And has a medium level of vocabulary for, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 year old. Yeah. yeah you yeah, can play it. Totally. And it shouldn't be a problem at all. It's a fully cooperative game where one player will cover their eyes while everyone else is given a clue. Maybe it's roses. And then all the players will write down a single clue onto their dry erase tablet in front of them. Right. The trick is, is that if any two players have the same word, then the player doesn't get to see that word. Right. So if two players said guns, like guns and roses, right. well, the guns would go face down. So I might say flower, someone else might say red, someone might say love or romance. Thorn. Valentine's. Yeah. And the idea is that if everyone says a different word, the person opens their eyes, gets to look at all this, these different words, red, flower, thorn, yeah. Valentine's. Oh, the word is obvious. It's rose. Yeah. But if two people said red, two people said thorn, and two people said flower, all you've got is love or Valentine's or something like that. Yeah. And that could be anything, right? So as a clue giver, you're trying to find the clue that is obscure enough that no other player at the table is going to be giving that clue, but not so obscure that it's completely useless as a clue to figure out the word. Yeah. And that's what quite often what will happen is you'll get four or five words and you'll look at all of them and they are, there's nothing. They're not related at all. And you're like, what? What? Yeah, exactly. And there's this hot seat feeling. Did you get sometimes yeah. in that position where you, you're looking at these words, and you know, I have no idea, but it's okay because it's totally cooperative. And the person who's guessing just like the title of the game gets just one guess. Yeah. And that's it. It's a brilliant game. It's really fun. Works really well. Yeah. You can't go wrong. And good for families. Can't go wrong with it ever. Another game that I find is great in this category, again, completely cooperative. Forbidden Island. Forbidden Island is a cooperative grid movement action point island adventure game for two to four players, ages 10 and up, that plays in about 30 minutes. Forbidden Island was designed by Matt Leacock and published by GameRight in 2010. It's just you, the pilot, the navigator, and the engineer trying to recover the four lost treasures on the Forbidden Island before the island is lost to the sea. You must work quickly, for if you don't, 
it won't be just the treasures that will never be seen again. The first thing you'll notice about a game of Forbidden Island are the components. The island is made up of thick, square, cardboard tiles with beautiful artwork depicting the various locations around the island, like the Dunes of Deception, the Whispering Garden, the Temple of the Sun, or the Bronze Gate. Right off the bat, I'm drawn into this game because this feels like it's a real place. Yeah. All the tiles go out, they're randomly placed around the board, and... The art's great, and it's beautifully detailed, Yeah, and the four treasures that you get are these beautiful sculpts, plastic sculpts, the earth stone, the statue of the wind, which is this yellow lion with wings, the crystal of fire, and the ocean's chalice. Right. First off, my kids are immediately like, okay, I just can I hold on to those while we play? <laughs> can I just hold on to that <laughs> while we play the game? Yeah, they're amazing. They're beautiful. And they they really help to make this world come alive a little bit. Yeah. Because it just, they kind of seem like they've walked out of, or fallen out of a book of Lion, the Witch, yeah. and the Wardrobe, right? Yeah, yeah. And now they're on this island and we're playing this game. And the like you said, the artwork is is like that too. It's just like out of the pages of, you yeah. know, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe cartoon yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. And, and uh it just feels real and exciting and good. Yeah. Yeah. Players begin their quests on the tile marked Fool's Landing, which has got a little helicopter pad on it. And this is where you begin the game. Mm. I just think that that's pretty hilarious. Yeah. This is where you have to <laughs> enter and exit the game from this tile. And you're a fool to have attempted it. To even try to. <laughs> <laughs> on a player's turn, they can take up to three actions. Mostly you're moving around the board and shoring up tiles. Because as the game progresses, tiles flip over to indicate that they have been flooded over. Players can delay this flooding by shoring up a tile and flipping it back to its full color side. Right. Should a flipped tile become flooded again, it is completely removed from the game and lost to the sea. Mm -hmm. The island's getting smaller and smaller. Right. And you can't get yeah. to each of these tiles, right? You have to let some of these tiles go. So you need to have, you need to make sure there's a path to the to the fool's landing so you can actually get off the island. Exactly. Yep. I right. You need to make sure where the treasure is located. Those tiles stay short up. And so there's a lot of running around trying to mitigate this flooding in only the ways you can. Right. Yeah. The flooding is a really clever mechanism where it's all done with a deck of cards. We've seen this mechanism in Pandemic as well, where each card is a different tile on the board. And when it comes up, it indicates that it's been flooded. And then when water rises, the amount of, of flooding that occurs is going to increase. The game gets more difficult. You take those same cards that we've been dealing with this whole game. You shuffle them all up and put them back on the top of the deck. Yeah. So the cards that are on the bottom stay in the bottom, and you're only really flooding those top cards over and over and over again, which escalates and accelerates the game mechanism and making sure that yeah, no, you know, Fool's Landing is going to be underwater if we're not really careful because it's been, you know, it's at the top of the deck. It keeps coming up. It's over and over again. Yeah. Right? It could be very, very punishing. And it's a really, really clever game to try to, like, figure out what that puzzle is and how can we... Right? There's a little bit of randomness. Sure. For sure. Like, some games are going to be harder than others. Yeah. And some games could be maybe hopeless, which feels a bit discouraging. If you are going to win, you really have to work together, though. Absolutely. And sometimes that means you know, it, the game turns into a bit of an alpha gamer, right? Where one person sort of says, no, 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 we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And usually that's the person who's played it the most or is sure. most experienced with these kinds of games. But, you know, it's a good way to learn it too, right? Yeah. I mean, if, yeah. if you're playing with young kids, sometimes they're going to need that direction, right? Yeah. Because to play the game and get absolutely crushed at, you know, even 11 and 12, 13 years old, isn't that fun? So sometimes you got to listen to mom yeah, and dad. Yeah. No, no, here's why we're going to do that. And that could be a learning experience too. This game, we got out and learned it together, mm. right? Like my first game was their first game. We're all learning it at the same time. And so there wasn't a lot of that, right? There was a little bit of alpha gaming in that. Right. You know, maybe we should try this. Like somebody has to be a leader. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, well, I'm open to suggestions. Mm. 
So Forbidden Island is the youngest, the starter game of this series. That's right. Yeah, I guess this is a trilogy of games. Yeah. First, Forbidden Island, the sequel being Forbidden Desert, which is slightly more complicated, and for me, is the Goldilocks of the three. Okay. And then Forbidden Sky yep. is the third one and the, the most challenging. Forbidden Desert's super fun. Players have crash-landed in a desert and they're trying to stay away from a sandstorm that's slowly covering the map with sand. And they need to travel along the board, recovering their pieces from their flying machine so that they can reassemble it and escape. So different right. theme from the original. We're not, you know, stealing treasure. We're just trying to survive. I like to say thematically, we've just escaped from the island. And on our way home from the island, we <laughs> crash into the desert. <laughs> And have to reassemble our ship. That's, right. yeah, no, that's very good. <laughs> the third and final game, Forbidden Sky, is up in the like a I don't know, I don't know scaffolding a spaceship. I, don't, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, up in the clouds, yeah. I guess. Um, There's a constant fear of falling off. You're kind of up in the clouds on this sort of scaffolding thing, mm -hmm. and the goal is to connect a circuit of cables that kind of go through different conduits and different things. And connect to a rocket ship yeah. that is on there. And you want to power up the rocket ship and get to it before you are struck by lightning or blown off the <laughs> scaffolding and falling to the, your death at the depths below. There seems to be a lot more ways to die in that game than the other game. And what's important to note is that the rocket ship is an actual plastic rocket ship that lights up yeah. and makes noise when you successfully launch it. It sits in the middle of the table and it acts as this sort of beacon for everyone on the team to, we've got to get there and right. we've got to find it and, and, focus. And, and get all the parts that's necessary and build the, the cables. It, it's quite cool. And it makes like a little spaceship noise when it's finally powered up like and it literally is a circuit that you're creating yeah. right yeah it's got a little battery inside it real wires yeah. yeah yeah have you ever won uh that one i think i've won once okay yeah but every time we play it we're like okay just make the ship make the noise <laughs> <laughs> even if we didn't win we always make sure that the ship you know is powered up yeah. because it's that's that's fun it's fun yeah it's got great components. It's definitely the more impressive looking. Well, I don't know. They they all are impressive in their own yeah. way. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. They all have good components. They all have, you know, a good table presence. They're all good. I think if you really want to win all the time, you want to play Forbidden Island. Yeah. And if you want a, a nice challenge, but not too challenging, Forbidden Desert. Right. And if you're just looking to be punished. <laughs> Forbidden Sky. But all of them, great family games. You and the kids can play those games. That's always a good time. What about some games for adults? Like mm -hmm. kids that have gone off to school and we want to play games now in the yeah. evenings. Or they're coming back for the holidays and we're going to get together and we're going to play them. Or just neighbors and friends, you know, games for adults, that kind of thing. I had Blank Slate out. Just the other day. Oh, yes. With the family, big group of us. The kids are back from university for the weekend. And yeah, it was a huge success. We, we talked about Blank Slate in our Fantastic Fillers episode. Yeah. But it was an all-night affair for this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we played it three times in a row kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good giggly little game. You can play that with eight people. Yeah. You can have a glass of wine with it. It's Yeah, three to eight players. So you need at least three to play that one, unfortunately. But yeah. Yeah. And I think it works better with a bigger group. I don't think it works so well with three. Yeah, I agree. It works really well with a big group yeah. of people. Codenames is another one that works well with a big group of people. Those people can come and go even while you're playing the game. Yeah. So long as you have like a core four, maybe, that sort of, sort of keep it together. That's that's another yeah. game that's very, very popular with our family. Codenames goes from two to eight, but I think you could even go as easily as... You could do 10 or 12. I mean... And like you said, if somebody has to, you know, oh, I got to go stick the, the roast in the oven yeah. or I got to go, the kids are in the basement making noise. I got to go check on them. They can disappear for 10 minutes and come back and still. And it's not going to stop the game. Yeah. No, 
will just keep playing without you. And it works really, really well that way. And I think it's one of those games everybody should have again. Earlier, I said just one is a game that everyone, every gamer should have in their collection. Yeah. I think Codenames is probably one of those. Like it's this sort of multi purpose, plays a lot, yeah. you know, and, and does a really good job and plays short. Like you can play m- multiple times in a row. Essentially, in Codenames, players are split into two teams, and there is a Codemaster assigned to each team. There's a bunch of words on cards placed on a table in a 5x5 grid, and each team is assigned a certain number of cards or words that they must signal to their teammates. The problem is that there's one card on the table that is the assassin, and if anybody touches that card, they immediately lose. The only way the Codemaster can communicate with their teammates is through one-word clues. And they give that one word and then say how many cards that clue is good for. So they might say something like, Leaf, three. Now you're looking at all 25 words on the table, trying to figure out which ones are related to Leaf and which ones aren't. Right. So I might see the word tree and think, oh, well, that's definitely one of the three. Yeah. But what are the other ones? There's, you know, park. Well, they have leaves in parks, Mm. but I don't know. And, you know, and you have to guess which ones they are. It's very, very fun. It's very, very fun. And easy to learn, very, very fast to pick up. You, you you spend very little time explaining it. Yeah, and that's crucial with all of these games, right? You want, if you're going to give a gift of gaming to somebody, you don't want to give them an, an encyclopedia <laughs> that they have to research or seven YouTube videos that they have to watch yeah, before exactly. they can really figure out how to play it. Yeah, yeah, and lots of times you don't have, you know, an hour or two to play the game, so the le- more time you're explaining, the harder it is. Yeah. To get people to agree. One that fits that really well is Wits and Wagers. Yeah. Wits and Wagers is a trivia game. Everyone can understand a trivia game thanks to games like Trivial Pursuit. Yeah. But it's a trivia game where knowing the right answer is not important. Yeah. It's more about betting who you think will know the right answer. Yeah. So in other words, it's a question about, you know, the first comic book that ever featured a caped hero. And I know that Susan isn't really a big comic book nerd, but Sarah is. Mm -hmm. So Sarah says that this comic book happened in 1902. So I'm going to bet on her answer being right. Yeah. I can make up my own answer. I could say 1901. I could make 1982. I could say 2022. It doesn't really matter. Of course, if I get it right, I get more points. But the real point of Wits and Wagers is knowing who you're playing with and who you think is going to get this right. Yeah. And literally, you're placing wagers on it. It's like a big green felt. Yeah, like Vegas. Yeah, Vegas style. Yeah. Yeah. You will organize everybody's guesses in numerical order. And so you'll have the middle guess, the median one that is average out of everyone on the table. That's only going to pay out two to one, but the really outlandish guesses on the ends will pay out five to one. If they, yeah. Right. Cause who, one million, who said that? That's ridiculous. Right. And, they, <laughs> like, and it's great. Cause sometimes those are the correct ones. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of the fun of the game too, is, is lots of times it's like, Oh, I'm so sure I've got this. I know the answer. Yeah. And you find out that you weren't just wrong. You were way wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and you learned a little bit about it. And, and that's you the really thing you can take them it winnings from your previous guests and apply them to your next guests and potentially right. really double down and like like make serious buck it's all about winning the most amount of money at the end of the game yeah but of course you could just as easily lose it because you did not correctly guess the height of the eiffel tower or who would guess the correct answer of the height of the eiffel tower that's right that's what happens to me every game of wits and wagers that i've played i end up broke at the end i end up with the same <laughs> money i started with <laughs> Quacks of Quedlinburg, it comes to mind mm. right now because it's a great game. It plays two to four players and in this age group in about 45 minutes. And it's got that bag building, yeah. tactile thing going on. We talked about it in our deck building episode because technically it is a deck builder, bag builder game. Yeah. This is a slightly more advanced kind of game. It's a deck building game, 
if your group is familiar with games like Dominion, which is probably the biggest deck building game there is, Mm -hmm. Quacks is a great one to pull out. Yeah, super fun. Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride is a set collection network building train game for two to five players ages eight and up that plays in about an hour. Ticket to Ride was designed by Alan R. Moon and published by Days of Wonder in 2004. In Ticket to Ride, players are collecting train cards so that they can claim routes between cities on a map and have the biggest and most successful network on the board. At the start of the game, players will be given some tickets they need to fulfill, maybe building a route from Montreal to Atlanta, or Los Angeles to New York, or maybe Sault Ste. Marie to Oklahoma City. Each of these cards is worth a different set of points depending on how difficult it would be to complete. On a player's turn, they can either draft two of the face-up train cards available on the table, or claim a route between two cities by discarding matching train cards of that route's color. Players can also take an action that will get them more tickets that they can try to complete for more points. This is one of the most simplest games we've talked about in this episode. Yes. It takes longer to get the game out of the box (laughs) than it does to teach somebody. It does. You're taking one of three different actions on your turn. Yeah. You're either taking cards or you're using them to build a route or you're taking more root cards, basically. That'll get you more points. Yeah. Who's ever doing that? (laughs) I'm always finding it real. I mean, yes, you do do that maybe once or twice in a game. Really? Uh, Oh, you've got to play with us. Sherry is quite innovative in her ticket to ride strategies. Really? She will often make the first turn, even sometimes the first two turns, drawing more tickets. Oh, wow. Yeah, it it throws you off because it's like, what's that person doing? Why are they doing that? Yeah, why is she doing that? Yeah, she's just trying to get destination tickets that have similar routes. So she can double up on the same. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, you know, they want to go to New York, but she can stop by Pittsburgh along the way and fulfill another ticket or something. yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot more strategy than it seems. It's a very simple game. It is a very simple game. Like, yeah. what is happening? What's going on? But you're right. Yeah. There is a lot of different decisions being yeah. made. And in fact, this could have easily fit into another age range of gamers, I think. Yeah. I think there are kids who are seven, eight, nine who potentially could play Ticket to Ride and do. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The tension comes from when someone starts laying down train cards. So all of a sudden you're laying trains down on the left side of the board and I don't have anything on the left side of the board, so I don't care. And then all of a sudden you or someone else starts putting them in the middle where all my destinations are. And all of a sudden my blood pressure rises. I'm, oh, oh, they're taking my roots They're I'm not going to get it. I'm going to have to go around. I've been saving (laughs) these blue cards and, and, and now he's just used all the blue spots. I have to use these for somewhere else. Where am I going to go? It it causes quite a bit of tension. Yeah. I like it. It's very good. I'm not a fan of the set collection. Yes. Right. As a mechanism, the root building adds another level, which just changes the game for me completely into something that's way more entertaining yeah and you're right it's that tension because you have five blue cards in your hand and you need seven to do that giant stretch right like that's a massive stretch yeah it's going to be worth a lot of points when you get it and it's going to connect those two cities it's crucial to your network you're almost there yep and then somebody builds something like right next to it and you're like (laughs) what are they coming this way how much they got look at the size of the cards they have in their hand because there is no limit to the number of cards you can hold in your hand. Yeah. You can just hoard and hoard and hoard cards until you're ready to like unleash hell. Yeah. And there is that tension, which is, which is super fun. Yeah. Ticket to Ride is one of those games that's won, you know, the ridiculous amount of awards, Countless. including yeah. the, the Spiel de Jar in 2004, that's which right. is the German game of the year. It sold over 3 million copies 
And there are, uh, uh, I think gazillion would probably be the technical term. Yes, that's the correct number. A gazillion versions of the game? Yeah. Expansions and different versions. There's a little kid version, My First Ticket to Ride. All different parts of the world have it, yeah. uh, except for Canada. We're represented with a couple cities in the base game, but the, we don't have a Ticket to Ride Canada. Sault Ste. Marie is pretty north, and it's on there, so I'm impressed. <laughs> But there's Nordic countries, there's Ticket to Ride Europe, there's everything. Yeah. The Nordic countries one is interesting because the map is specially geared for three players. Mm. Normal Ticket to Ride can go up to five players, whereas the Nordic countries one is specifically limited to three. Yeah. And they all have different little quirks to them. Sometimes you're crossing water with boats. Yeah. Sometimes you're digging tunnels to put your trains underneath the ground, that kind of thing. And the other thing is the app. There's a Ticket to Ride app that you can get at the App Store. And that's really good. I still have my physical copy of a few different versions of Ticket to Ride. Yeah. And we'll pull them out and play them occasionally. Yeah. But I do play the the app quite a bit more these days no way because i can play all the cities you know in oh, the, in the night yeah. before i fall asleep <laughs> nice so what if you've got friends that don't have any kids just the two of them and they've come over and played a few games they're a little keen they're they'd like to play but you know you you want to you want to just like give them that extra nudge yes Give them that game that they'll be able to take home and convert them. The one I always recommend in this situation is Carcassonne. Carcassonne is not yeah. a game just for two players. It's a two to five player game, yeah. but it works fantastically with two players. We talked about Carcassonne in our modern classics episode. Yeah, we did. And it works really well for, for couples because there's not a lot of wait time in between turns, yeah. right? I mean, if you're playing with five players... It can slow down, but if you're playing it with two, it, it moves along really quickly. It's really tight. It's very nice. Yeah. It's a fun one. Yeah. And then if you have another couple come over, it can play that as well. And there's tons of expansions. Yeah. Very, very, very good. And you're building this city with all the different tiles and it looks amazing when it's all done. And yeah. Lots of wooden pieces that you're putting on the tiles. It's great. Yeah. It's got that, you know, short learning curve. It's an easy one to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I really like it. Highly recommend it. It's one that Sherry and I have played tons of times. Yeah. Tons. I've had some success with Fox in the Forest as a gift. Oh, okay. Because the recipient was really into trick-taking games. They're fans of Euchre and that kind of thing. Okay. But they don't have four players all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you're a fan of Euchre but only have two players, Fox in the Forest is your game because it is a two-player competitive trick-taking game that is elegant and beautiful. The production is very simple. Yep. Nice little small box. Art on it is gorgeous. Foxtrot Games, right? Yeah. I'm a huge fan. It's just this tight trick-taking game. It's a deck of cards, three suits. And the trick to this one is that you do not want to win all the tricks. Right. There's a th possible 13 set of tricks you can win in a round. And you want to get the sweet spot and not win them all. Um, if you do win all the tricks, then you bust and the other player gets mucho points. And so you don't, you don't want to do that. So this is a really interesting tug of war sort of balancing act you're doing within the traditional trick ticking mechanisms. Cool. The other one I love is a strictly two player game called Patchwork. Oh yeah. We talked about this one on the table for two Games for two players episode. Yeah. Patchwork is a two player only game. Takes about 20, 25 minutes. And you are building a little quilt basically with these polyomino sort of Tetris style pieces onto your board. And it's just a nice, quiet, relaxing, yeah. strategic game that, you know, has some thought, but isn't super taxing and is fun. And you're not really taking anything away from your opponent. It's just a nice, delightful experience. Nice. Wingspan. Wingspan is a dice rolling, engine building, bird collecting card game for one to five players, ages 10 and up, that plays in about 70 minutes. Wingspan was designed by Elizabeth Hargrave and published by Stonemeyer Games in 2019.
In Wingspan, players are bird researchers, ornithologists, watchers, and enthusiasts, trying to attract the best birds into their wildlife sanctuaries. Each bird can trigger powerful combinations with their habitat, creating opportunities for players to build a card-driven engine that will help them attract bigger and better birds, have those birds produce eggs and other effects, and potentially complete end-game scoring objectives. Wingspan contains over 170 bird illustrations by Beth Sobel, Natalia Roja, and Anna Marie Martinez. These cards will also have a little factoid about each bird at the bottom. Yeah. In like a little flavor text. Yeah. And it tells you where they are in the world and a little bit of detail about them. Yeah. Very interesting. Immediately, this appeals to, I mean, every part of me. Like this is... Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you put do that? Okay, you've got, you spent all this time and energy to create this beautiful image of this bird. And now we have a little fact, and I just love that. Yeah. I just, like, it just, I don't know. It's not, like, immersive or anything, but it just, it feels like, oh, yeah, we're playing a bird game. Yeah. This is about birds. Mm. And they're beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful art. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah, it's just great. I was surprised when I did the research that the art was done by three different artists because the style, yeah. into, like, it doesn't seem disjointed at all. It just seems very cohesive and... Uh, very good point, yeah. Yeah. Players are drafting cards and then playing them into their tableau, which is a beautiful board painted like a colorful nature sanctuary. Sections for habitats, the forest, desert, and water. So the robin card that you drafted will be played into the forest habitat where the swan has to be played in the water. Right. Actions include playing a bird, gaining food from the bird feeder, which is a dice tower and the food is dice. You can lay eggs or you can draw more bird cards. Each game of Wingspan is different because the conditions for scoring change from game to game. There's these scoring rule tokens that are shuffled up and then placed on the board that marks off the rounds. And so these tokens are scored at the end of each round. Depending on which tokens you get, it's going to be a completely different game. Yeah. What stays the same about Wingspan is the engine building that players are doing they're trying to find these combos of cards and habitats to produce a boost in an area like making food or in making eggs or drawing more cards yeah it's very clever i love this game it's one of our current go-tos when it's just sherry and yeah. i and we're going to sit down and play a game wingspan is really really good i don't have a lot of experience with engine building card games Terraforming Mars is a good example where the various things you can do in the game are on the cards and the cards in this wingspan, there's 170 cards. Yeah. It's huge. And each card's doing something differently and you're not going to know what you can do until you see those cards and you're only seeing a handful of cards at a time. And so those kinds of games that have that going for me can be very difficult to get my head around. You don't even know what's possible, let alone, you know, what cards you're going to get next round or even know what cards are even in the deck. I haven't seen anything yet. Right. And so it's really hard to get my head around how to play a game like that. But with Wingspan, it didn't feel like that at all. It didn't feel like there was like the deck was a complete mystery. Each ability that comes out is unique and you haven't seen it before. And it's going to do something cool for you. But it didn't feel as though it was like game breaking or, or shocking at all. Like it just seemed to fit and seemed to be intuitive. Yeah. And that, and that yeah. wall, that barrier wasn't there. Which is really saying something for the amount of cards. Like other, you know, tableau building games like Gizmos or Uncharted is one that, that stands out to me as a good one. You know, it's a relatively small pool of cards that you're adding to. Yes. The all players are adding to. And it's certainly not 170 cards. Yeah. It's good. Sometimes a card that you play into your tableau is going to give you lots of points because it was incredibly hard to play. Like you needed to come up with a bunch of food in order to get it there. And while it's sitting in your tableau, it doesn't do anything. Whereas other cards are pretty easy to get into your tableau right. that will give you any points 
but they'll give you like a little boost. Like every time you activate that row, you get to draw an extra card or you get to lay an extra egg or something like that. And it's those, mm. right? It's that balance between, oh, if I play this cheap card first and then I get to take that action on that row, that's going to give me the extra card that I need to discard in order to get the extra food when I take the top action. <laughs> and it's right, it's all of this. Yeah. Like the first time I played it, I felt like it was a bit like a, a multiplayer solitaire game. Like we're all playing the same game. Yeah. But. I'm just really doing my own thing. And every now and then, you know, one of you guys take the card I wanted and I'm like, uh, that's right. You know, but the rest is just me figuring out how can I maximize the cards that are in my tableau and the ones that are in my hand that yet to be played. Yeah. And you know, some of the, the birds require that they basically eat one of the birds or the cards from your hand. Right. That's right. And you're like, Oh, I wanted to play this card. If I do that, then I need eggs first and then I won't have a bird to eat <laughs> and I won't be able to take full advantage yeah. of all the combos that are, yes. are coming together yeah. at that time. So it's, it's about, you know, making sure you have food at the right time and the number of cards at the right time and, and that kind of thing, and then take the right action. And it's also wingspan is also a really friendly ish kind of game. Yeah. Like the rules are pretty forgiving in that there's a lot of cards that, you know, it'll be like, everyone gets an egg. Everyone can take this food from supply. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Oh. Isn't it? We're all bird watchers. I mean, that player's getting two food, but at least I get one. Yeah, we're all bird watchers, and we all just got a little worm for our birds or something <laughs> yeah, like that. It's yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, it's it's not like, oh, okay, kill a bird on the person's left. There's none, none of, that of that in this yeah, game. No, I, no. <laughs> yeah, I think there is some more cards in later expansions that do increase player interaction. Right. But I don't think anybody's having birds plucked out of their... <laughs> removed from their sanctuaries. Yeah, they're once they're in there, they're safe. Yeah. 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 Wingspan has sold over one million copies in just three years. And that's, I think, partially due to its art a theme and production. Mm -hmm. So Stonemaier Games does this. They double down on their components. When they get a game they know is good, yeah. they will, right? We've seen it in Scythe, one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. And Viticulture. And and this is another one where the dice tower does not need to be a bird feeder. There doesn't even need to be a dice tower in this game. No. But there is one. Yeah. And all the cards have that nice linen finish. Yeah. The player boards I was mentioning, those tableaus, they fold in half. And when they are in half and to go into your box, the back is uh, printed like a journal. It looks like a leather bound journal. So yeah. I'm going to hand you your, a leather bound journal and you're going to open it up. And oh, now it's my tableau and I'm going to put it on the table. Yeah. Why does it look like a journal when it's closed? It just, what, that's not a game feature. Right? <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with the game, but it has everything to do with creating this theme and this experience. Oh, I am a bird watcher. Of course I have this leather bound book. That totally makes sense. Yeah, exactly. The dice tower that comes with the game, like the standard base game, it's not a deluxe version. Yeah. It's this cardboard box that is a dice tower and it looks like a bird feeder. Yeah. And you put the, the dice in the back and they kind of clank around yeah. inside and come out the bottom and that's the dice. Yeah. It could have easily just been the dice. You just roll them on the table and put them in the middle. Exactly. But they, they decided to make this beautiful yeah. dice tower. Bird feeder dice tower. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. Another category I think we should talk about is like stocking stuffers. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's what society calls it. To me, they're just small games with a small price point. Yeah. They're usually pretty small. They can fit in your pocket or your purse and you can bring them to game night really, really easily. And no one knows you didn't bring this yeah. big game bag with three games in it. And it's like, no, I just happen to have a game right here in my pocket That's that right. we could play. Yeah. 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 And they just wrap them up around Christmas time and just give them to anybody. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. The mailman. Oh, right. Forgot. Here you go, mailman. Exactly. And usually they are a smaller price point, so it's easier to give them as gifts and it works really well. With that in mind, the probably the smallest of these 
is the pack of game series from perplex oh yeah they look like a pack of gum a little stick of gum yeah they literally look like a stack a stick of gum like you can fit three or four of them in your pocket and not even (laughs) notice that they're there this is a line of games like i think there's 20 or maybe 30 of them i'm not even sure i haven't played them all i haven't played most of them even but the ones that i've played they're all really simple yeah easy to learn there are uh, usually card games of some kind, and they each have their own very different rules. Like there, you know, there's a pick up and deliver game in one. There's a set collection in another. Yeah. There's one of them is a dexterity game. One's a spelling game. Of those, I'd say my favorites are Dig. Mm-hmm. Dig is about dogs who have buried their bones and are digging up bones, yeah. and trying to get the most valuable bones. Very cute. Very fun. Bus is a pick up and deliver game. Very good. Fly is so unique looking. I think it's so cute. You lay it out. It's kind of like a red and white checkerboard picnic table, yeah. tablecloth. Yeah. And it's got little flies on the cards. And from a certain height, like above the box, you're dropping a card that <laughs> is uh, the picture of a fly swatter. And you're trying to swat That's the right, trying to land them on there. Yeah. yeah. It's like flower fall. Yeah. But really, really tiny. The novelty of those, the fact that they can fit so much game in such a tiny package is pretty unique. Yeah. I've not really found one that I didn't like, so those those are really good. Nice. Another small game, not nearly that small, but we've talked about Illusion in our Five Fun Games for Families episode. Illusion is a color guessing game. It's a, just a deck of cards, and each of those cards has a unique image on it containing four different colors in addition to the background white. It's red, yellow, blue, and green. And it'll just be like a random splotches or a geometric pattern or shape. Yeah. And players have to take uh, the card that they are given and put their card in order from most of one color to the least of one color. And the rounds have changed, so one round will be red. And see who has most red. Where does this card have a lot of red, or does that card have a little bit of red? And you have to place the card on the line, guessing how much red there is. Yeah, It's always a quick, simple game. It's a big hit with the players. Doesn't overstay its welcome. It's just, you know, it's a nice, nice quick one. And it's so unique in its mechanism. It's like, oh, we're gonna play a card game, but not like you think. Yeah, and anyone can learn it and play it. Like, maybe not well, but anyone yeah. can understand the concept, learn the rules, and play it. Like, I played it with my four-year-old niece, and, and she yeah. just picked it up right away. It was just like, oh, yeah, this card has more red than that one. Yeah. Done. Okay, good, kid. You did great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, super fun. One that we've been getting into a lot lately is taco, cat, goat, cheese, pizza. Have you played this thing? No. No, I haven't. No. It is a real-time game that has everyone with a a deck of cards, and you are flipping a card, and you say the next word in sequence. So the first player, they flip a card, and they say taco. The next player flips the top card of their deck and says cat. The next one says goat. The next one says cheese and pizza. And these cards all have that word on them, and they have a cute little graphic on them. So if it's a cat, it's a picture of a cat. Okay. Now, here's the catch. If when I say the word taco... My card that I flipped yeah. has a taco on it. Yeah. We all rush <laughs> no. to slap our hands <laughs> on the pile of cards in the middle of the table. No. Yeah. And whoever slaps their hand last has to take them as points, as negative <gasps> points, basically. Oh, it's a speed game. Punishing the slowest one. <laughs> oh, it's got the no. fun of something like Go Splits, but for for us anyway, it's a new experience yeah. because it's a new game. A lot more sounds like it would be a lot more laughs than Go Splits. Go Splits is is panicky and fun, but not wacky. Yeah, it usually ends in you know, uh, you know everybody's cheeks hurting. <laughs> and there's lots of different versions of it. Have five different words, and and the special action cards are all different in each one. Very fun. Another one that I love is called Cover Your Assets. Yeah. It's a bit of a play on word. Cover Your Assets. Uh, yeah, I hear. It's a two to six player game published by Grandpa Beck's Games. 
and it is a kind of mean game. Yeah. You are, are collecting cards in your hand that are these different kinds of assets. So the, one of them might be a set of jewelry. One of them might be a board game collection. Mm-hmm. There is a set of cards like that. Yeah. There could be a bank account or classic cars or a coin collection. And once you have two or more of the same cards, you can put it down in front of you into your pile. Mm-hmm. And that becomes your points pile. But if anyone else on their turn has... You know, let's say I put the, the the classic cars on top of my pile. If they have a classic car card in their hand, they can steal that top set from mine and put it into their pile. So it's really mean. Like you're going yeah. around stealing each other. And as you do, you're adding more cards. Every card has a value on it. So if you're stealing from someone else, you're adding to the value of that collection, making it much more valuable for other people to steal it. There's a random element to it, obviously, sure. because you have to have the card and the cover your part of the cover your assets game is once you've got this sort of valuable stack of like six or seven cards of, you know, maybe it's a set of six or seven jewelry that you've stolen that was stolen three or four times and you stole it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's worth a lot. You want to, instead of adding to it with more jewelry, you want to add another set of assets on top of it. Just to cover it up, right? So it's no longer the top thing. Exactly. So so you're going to put your cheap little stamp collection on top (laughs) of it. So somebody's got to steal a stamp collection before they can get to the... Before they can get to the thing. And then you're constantly covering and covering and covering until the really good stuff's at the bottom and people can't steal it. Buried. And there's gold cards and silver cards and yeah. everyone we've introduced this game to has gone out and bought it. Yeah. Like they love this game. My family loves this game. They've introduced it to five or six other couples. They've all went and bought it. Yeah. You can play it with kids as young as eight. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just a really simple card game. It's sort of harkens back to those times, you know, of, of our youth when you were sitting around playing rummy or something like that. It does feel like rummy or those kinds of traditional card games, but the cards have these collections on them. Like you said, like, oh, there's a board game collection in this game. Yeah, one of them is board game collection. And I just find that like, oh, well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to collect the board game, right? Like, (laughs) right. It's not an ace of spades or a queen of diamonds or something that I'm trying to set collect. I'm trying to collect, you know, stuff. Yeah. And it just feels like that extra little bit of theme. It's razor thin, but it just, right. It just adds a little... And when someone steals you like your piggy bank collection, it's like, oh, okay, that's fine. I'm not going to fight over that. But do not take my collection of yachts, that's right. right? Because I'm going to I'm going to hold back a yacht card in case someone tries to steal my yacht. That's right. And that's part of the strategy as well. Is is maybe you don't use all your cards. And and when someone does try to steal part of your collection, you get a chance to defend yourself. And you defend it by playing another similar card. Oh, wow. And it can go back and forth three or four times if everyone has that same card. <laughs> because there's multiple copies of each card. Yeah. And that's where it gets really fun. Nice. Another card game with a similar theme would be for sale. It's not nearly as mean. Yes. But it is that quick and easy property auction game and i've taught to countless people now and it's super simple and quick to learn yeah we talked about for sale in our fantastic fillers finale episode and it's this tight little quick property auction game that i just love right because i mean i'm a huge fan of auction games but only the little auction games. I, mean, I don't want to play a big auction game, but a nice little short auction game. <laughs> that can be a lot of fun where you can drive the property up really high and then one player like loses all their money and they've got one really good card, but then no money to buy any more cards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's an excellent game. And uh, like the last game, everyone I've shown it to is like, oh, I've got to have that yeah. game. I like that game. It's really, really simple. It's easy to learn. And it's played in two parts where you're buying properties and then the second act is selling the properties yeah, for money and whoever has the most money wins yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that's a great one. Good one one more that i want to mention is one that i've recently been turned on to thanks to board game arena actually we played it for the first time on board game arena i liked it oh, okay liked it so much i had to go out and grab a couple decks so the game is called Similio, and it is a deduction 
cooperative game. Oh, Yeah, I know. You're going to love it. <laughs> it's just a deck of cards, and there's not even very many. I, I don't even remember how many cards are, but 30, maybe 40 different cards. And they come in different themes. So one deck might be spooky monsters like Frankenstein and Dracula and ghosts. Another one might be animals or historic figures like okay. Cleopatra or something. And we put the cards out in a little grid. One person plays the clue giver and everyone else is trying to guess the one card on the table of face up cards that they've chosen. Okay. So if it was the animals, I, you know, I might've chosen the penguin, for example. Okay. And, you know, on the table is an elephant and a hippopotamus, a rhinoceros, a bird, a flamingo, a parrot, mm -hmm. different animals. And I'm going to play a card from the unused cards and I'm going to give it as a clue and I'm going to say by the way I place it either up and down or left and right I'm going to say this card or this animal is similar to the one that I've chosen oh yeah secretly chosen or if I put it the other way it's dissimilar okay so if my animal is a bird, I might choose the, you know, the giraffe and say he's dissimilar right. because he's not. Or if it's, if it's a really big animal, you know, I might choose the hippopotamus and say it's similar right. because it's the rhinoceros or something like that. Huh. And how you do the clues is totally up to your own creativity Nice as the giver. It can be the color, like, you know, black and white for the penguin. You know, is it a raccoon? Is it something else? I don't know if there's a raccoon in the game, but you get the yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. The elephant's gray, and so is the rhinoceros, that kind of thing. Does it have wings? Doesn't it? Uh, historic figures, you know, does it have a hat? Is it Egyptian? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Um, you know, those kinds of things. There's a Harry Potter version. There's like wild animals. You can play with two decks where, you know, like say I'm playing with, I'm the clue giver and I use the wild animals to give you clues for the more domesticated kind of, oh, animals, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. So yeah, okay. they really work well together. Really, really short. It's, you know, it's a 10, 15 minute game. The game says it's two day players, but again, it's as many people as you can fit around the table. Yeah, it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah. And everyone has to agree on what the the cards is. And what happens is, so I say this animal is unlike the other ones. And you guys, on the first round, I think you have to take out three cards, and then you have to take out two cards, and then one card. And basically, slowly but surely, you're revealing the last animal, mm -hmm. or the last card is, is the one that you think is my secret card. Very fun. Very simple. Yeah. Can be played with a ton of different age groups. Recommended for seven and up. Easily you could do that with younger, but they might need some help. Very cool. What are some good games or good gift ideas for the hardcore board gamer in your life? Yeah, this one's a hard one, right? Because we talk a lot about board games. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the games that you like and that are in your collection. And you know a lot that are in mine, but without looking them up, I don't know every game in your collection. I don't know what you have and what you don't have. Yeah. So if I'm buying you a gift or if your wife comes to me and says, I really want to buy Matt a game, I got to really think hard. I got to do some research. I got to go on BGG and look at your game list and, and hope that you've kept it up to, yeah. up to date. You just need to check out my wish list. There you go. Yes. I'm user Hanover Fist on BoardGameGeek.com. You can check out my wish list on there. <laughs> If you wanted to buy me a gift. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's good. Um, I think the, the better idea, though, of course, is a gift card. Because nobody mm. knows what a board gamer wants better than a board gamer. And I could keep that wish list up to date daily, and it still wouldn't be accurate by lunchtime. <laughs> right, exactly. And then games go out of print, and it's hard to find, or they come and go out in and out of stock. Yes. Yeah, so a gift certificate, you can't go wrong. Yeah. Another good idea would be upgraded components for a game they already own. Yeah. Like, I remember I knew that Chris's favorite game was Viticulture, so I picked him up the metal coins for viticulture the metal lira you did to upgrade that game experience a little bit little tiny bit and they're awesome and i know that you've done that with scythe your favorite game yeah and you've got all the beautiful components for that so that's you know that's always a good option i think 
You can't go wrong with sleeves. Sleeves can be a little hard to purchase. Mm-hmm. So sleeves are, for those who aren't familiar, sleeves are those little plastic pockets that you put your cards in to, to protect them from fingerprints and smudges and that kind of thing. Now, every game has different size sleeves, so they can be kind of hard. But generally speaking, you know, the the standard sleeve size, the standard American sleeve size, so many games use that. Yeah. And I can never have too many of them. Yeah. I'm always buying standard American sleeves. You can't even go wrong with just buying a little assortment of them because it's always nice to get a new game and realize, oh, I've got three packs of the sleeves that are just perfect Mm, for this. True. The game mats are a nice gift idea too. It's always nice to play on Mm. that mat surface. Yes. I have a couple of different game mats, depending on which game I'm playing. So if it's a two-player card game, I've got a nice big black mat that can pretty much cover the space between the two of us, and we've got a nice little surface to play on. Or if it's just a single, like a solo card game, i got a slightly smaller one. Or if I'm playing a big, sprawling, epic Western dexterity shoot 'em up game, I've got a nice big yeah. uh, mat that can cover the entire table. Yeah, a very big table you, it can cover. It's very yeah. cool, that one. Yeah. What would you buy if one of our wives were to come to us and say, I want to buy Matt or Chris a game mat? What would you buy? Like, what would be the theme or the artwork on the game mat? What would you recommend? Oh, I would go with something plain, mm-hmm. personally. I don't like a lot of busy artwork on it. Yeah. I have one that's just like a flat, black mat right and it's i think there's a slight pattern to it like a stripe kind of but it's just in the manufacturing but mostly just like for the most part it's plain the smaller one is just plain red and then the big sprawling one that i use uh for flick them up is like a cave floor or could be the surface of mars or something right but it's very subtle like it's mostly just brown and if you really look at it you go yeah okay i guess it's terrain yeah but it's not busy enough. You're not losing money on it. You know yeah. what I mean? You're not like, you're like your tokens aren't getting lost in the artwork, which is, I think is the most important part. The one that you're talking about is usable in a lot of different games. Like you could use it in Forbidden Island yeah. because, you know, it's, yeah. it's it looks like it's dirt or brown, you know, from the island. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's very, very good that way. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get one that is like a space field, like star field or something like that. Yeah. I want to use it for the sci-fi games that I have. I think it would be yeah. good to play with Star Wars X-Wing on it, that kind of thing. X-Wing has to be played on a yeah. map, I find. Yeah, it just really elevates yeah. it. You can also get board game themed t-shirts or stickers or hats or posters for your game room wall, things like that which, of course, we know are available from Chris's website, geekygoodies.com. Have you played any of the games that we've talked about today? What games have you given as gifts? Drop us a line at escapeintoboardgames at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to the Escape Into Board Games podcast. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Escape Into Board Games. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps more people discover Escape Into Board Games, and you can get an Escape Into Board Games t-shirt at geekygoodies.com slash escape into board games. Or you can help us fuel the show by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash escape into BGS. This episode is produced by Matt McKenzie and Chris Cormier. Sound editing by Matt McKenzie. Production assistance by Sherry Cormier. Music by John Yasut and Daniel Carlton. See you at the next escape.